Sonic, the heart of your system. I'm the Award for Kit Guru. I'm here in London with uh, a lot of people from Azus. Uh, and we're going to go through a few questions, primarily to do a motherboard design, uh, but the conversation might drift slightly sideways. So that's the general idea. Uh, my opening question is to do with uh, motherboard chipset compatibility, CPUs. Uh, so uh, AMD has AM4, and that's going to be a platform for some years. Intel does things differently. From the point of view of designing products, what are your views on the subject? I think that, um, well, the, the, the chipset compatibility, I mean, not, not necessarily between every, C, every generation of CPU, you know, you don't necessarily have the same, same, same pin count or the same pin out, right? And also, like, the uh, internal architecture is different. Like, you might need, a, you know, different uh, VRM solutions to be able to support it. Right. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's, 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 I mean, for the customer, right, obviously, if you can have the same same chipset for a very uh, same chipset for a very long time you know it might uh, be beneficial in terms of cost but uh, it might limit you know the CPU design in terms of architecture or you know whatever I mean, I mean that makes sense within a product stack so you can have a, a very budget board and you wouldn't put the top processor in the stack when it when it's all quad core it seemed to be uh, the boards would vary by feature, and now we've got four, six, eight cores, and VRMs seem to be much more. It seems to be a conversation we've only had in the past two, three years. It's suddenly become a thing, and you wouldn't put that processor in that model. Uh, and as the number of cores has increased, that seems to be a bigger part of our testing, certainly. I'm not sure if it's filtered through to the public. Uh, but how. How does that work generation by generation with your choice of VRMs, for example? Uh, you mean the, the decision for, for each? Well, uh, yeah, uh, it, was, it was suggested um, by a, a few overclockers that uh, every motherboard manufacturer has more or less copy-pasted their design of uh, VRMs for years. No reason why it wouldn't. It works. And you just go, we use the same controller and the same number of VRMs same 50 amp stages is just work for years and years and years and now it just feels different uh well i think right now what you're looking at is the the, the difference in the core count between cpus yeah, right you, you got increasing core count and so obviously they're going to require more more current or whatever you know and you need uh you need a corresponding you know uh power solution to kind of you know really support that and yet on paper the tdp is the same for all these processes which is not helpful for, doesn't seem to be helpful for anybody. Um, I mean, a 90-something watt TDP when it's drawing 150 watts, 160 watts? Um, well, I mean, this is really only a problem with the overclock. Sure. Uh, is it? What, what, when you, when you have the dynamic? Well, I mean, that, that's when so. you'll start seeing, you know, very high power consumption numbers, right? Okay. Um, then I think you had a different question before where... I did, I did, uh, I jumped, yeah, I jumped yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you do al you did also submit another question, which was with the default power limit, right? Please. So it might might tie in a little point. bit Thank to that, yes. right? So I think on on our lower boards we do have we don't uh, increase the power limit too much. No. Uh, uh, the, the the tough gaming products, I believe, yeah. they're they're TDP limited, so although there, you there can. There is definitely some seg segmentation like that. Right. And then, uh, how big a step is it from tough gaming to prime and working up through the stack strings and such like? Uh, do you mean in terms of power limit or in terms of uh power limit and cpu support i suppose and and uh, how appropriate they are for the enthusiast well i mean if you're looking at like cpu support right if you're buying an eight core cpu um i think uh from our, our standpoint we don't see very many people buying a tough board and then buying an eight core cpu um, <laughs> right, and so you know, uh, as we move up the stack, you know, the the VRM solutions tend to get increasingly more powerful. Um, in addition to the digital spec as well. Um, so by the time you're getting to uh, maybe you know the strict stash E, you know, you're starting to get solutions that you know have a little bit of overhead to handle a little bit of overclocking or like you know be able to really you stress. Mentioned, the you mentioned the dash E there when I was looking through the ranges of boards you have on show the other side of that wall. I was trying to differentiate the dash E to the dash F, and it's like one VR, uh, one M.2 cover, two M.2 covers. 
How do you guys remember the product stack? <laughs> I think over the course of the development, you just you get asked so many times, you know, what are the specs for which things that you just kind of. It's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, the overclocking question I think I meant to ask you was about uh, Tim and solder. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you are an enthusiast, if you have a CPU that has Tim, are you wise to D-LID or is it still a bold move? <coughs> I mean, it, that's, that's just a choice you have to make as a computer, as, as a consumer, sure. right? Um, I mean, you will void your warranty, uh, but there are some gains to be made. Like if you delayed your chip, if you go by the 8700K example, right? Mm -hmm. If you put a better thermal paste, like a regular thermal paste in between, you might gain up to 15, 20 degrees in core temperatures when, uh, when you're heavily overclocked. It's tempting to ask a question that's rude about Intel for using TIM, but if, if we take a positive stance, when AMD decided to solder their heat spreaders, was that something that made you go, happy day, this makes life easy? <clears throat> um, I mean, for, for us, I don't think it makes that big a difference, right? It's right. primarily for the consumer. Okay. Then I'm not exactly sure what uh, caused Intel to change from previously solder to solder team for a certain I'd generation. I'd, I'd love to, uh, if, you, if you have an answer to that question, if any of you people can, <coughs> then I'd love to. I, I didn't ask the question because I assumed the answer was either was we don't know or we can't tell. No, we, I, we, we don't have the answer. To that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Memory, DDR4, there's a, an emphasis and I appreciate, I think, am I correct, Azus does not do memory. It's about the one product you don't do, right. The enthusiast gamer, should the enthusiast gamer pay close attention to clock speed of memory or should they concentrate on latency or is it just people who like to show off about numbers? Uh, right, so uh, I think that, um uh, higher memory frequency mainly means that you get higher margin, right? right? So I think if you do any kind of memory testing, you'll notice that uh, you might necessarily not get uh, very high gains with increased memory frequency, at least not after a certain point. Um, and this is because you need to increase latencies quite a lot after yeah. at a certain point. You also most of the time uh, run at a 2T command rate instead of 1T. Sure. Um, so I think you, you just need to optimize those settings. I think uh, from what I've been seeing personally, I will get the best performance at the highest frequency I can run at 1T command rate. So w when we, uh, obviously reviewers tend to deal with motherboards at an early stage and we don't tend to go back on the 10th the bias revision. We tend to get the, the problem time and then you might use it later. Um, and memory compatibility seems to be a nightmare for developers, just mm -hmm. and I'm not entirely clear why, unless it's just the number of permutations. But it just seems to be a horrible job for you. Uh, and I'm talking about just getting proper stability. Why, why is it so difficult? Is, this is across the industry. Mm -hmm. Why why is memory compatibility so tough? Right. Uh, so it's all up down to the signal quality, right? And I mean, you have the CPU you put into a socket. The pin contact will affect your signal quality. You have memory modules, you put them into a dim slot, which will also affect your signal quality. Right. A lot of times it may help just to clean the, the contacts, right? right. Um, on top of that, you have different memory modules with different memory ICs. The characteristics might change uh, over time just to changes in production, right? So there are so many variables that you need to account okay. for. I mean, I, I think I saw um, Roman did a, uh, an AMD Epic or some such where he was talking about inserting a CPU dozens of times to <coughs> get all, all the memory identified or some such, which obviously mm -hmm. is a similar thing, but yeah. far beyond. But assuming everything is working well, if, if the memory is all correctly detected and it boots up, it goes in the BIOS. At that stage, are yeah, you now confident it's all working or is there still... Right, so there's still this thing about uh, margin, right? right? So even if it works at default, it might not work at the rated speed. Okay. Um, and if you have a better contact scenario, it, it will also affect this margin. And the more margin you have, the, the higher the frequency you will be able to reach. As basic as that. <laughs> it's a, a, I mean this politely, it's a very mundane answer in a way, isn't it? So cleanliness and quality of components is... Uh, yeah, on top of different memory ICs, uh, I mean, different uh, difference in how good the IMC of the CPU is. Right. 
so you have you have so many factors that may affect uh, if your system boots at all and or if it's able to run the rated speed and uh, and this is all entirely separate to the manufacturer's QVL list this is which as we know are already this long you have any number of products listed I mean I've, I've had success with memory that's not on QVL and I've had failures with memory that's on the QVL which suggests the QVL is you know top well, if, if you don't plug the memory stick correctly, then <coughs> you can't account for that in QVL, well, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's the yeah. reviewer's fault. Um, a very basic question, a wide-ranging question. How many CPU cores does the enthusiast gamer need? Uh, I think that uh, that really en ends up, you know, being in, in terms of pure game. Okay, if you're t talking about just the game. I'm not going to tell you that all games are threaded for multi-core, um, you know, right? And so. Yeah, you know, if you're just playing a game, you might not need that many cores. But who just plays a game anymore, right? Who doesn't listen to music? Who doesn't alt tab and start surfing? Or who doesn't download in the background? Nobody just plays a game anymore, you know? And so that's why you do see a little bit of the increase in core count. Um, and at the same time, right, that's, I think uh, there's a little bit of uh, kind of just the enthusiast community just kind of lusting after performance gains, you know, which is why there's, I think, a little bit buzz around those high core count, uh, higher core count CPUs, you know, um, I think. And then, like, um, at the same time, right, if you're a gamer, again, right, you're never just the gamer. A lot of times you create content or a lot of times you do work or you do other things. And so having the flexibility of a, a higher core count system still ends up a net benefit for users, assuming you're getting it at a similar price point. And if you're looking at uh, the price of a six core CPU, a high end six core CPU was the same price or similar uh, price segment to the i7 uh, four core CPU uh, of a previous generation. Right. So if, if an eight core came along, the question is how expensive would it be? That's a very good that's a thought. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Can I add something more so about please, the. Please, please. Yes, okay. Uh, in terms of memory compatibility mm. topic, you know, uh, in past years, when ASUS released a new motherboard, yeah. actually, internally, we have uh, finished uh, the compatibility test more than 1,000 items. Right. Yes, always more than 1,000 items. Not only memory, but also all the other key components, such as power supply, yeah. right, or even some, uh, some softwares. Okay, so our job is to ensure the best compatibility from ASUS motherboard. In past years, few medias from other countries did memory compatibility test across other motherboards and also memory modules. Give you some examples, you know, probably if you want to finish this job, you need to uh, buy uh, maybe uh, five different motherboards from different vendors, also 30, 50 different memory modules. If you really do this, you know, the, the, the com combination is huge. Yeah, then in the end, ASUS com compatible ratio could be more than 95% to 98%. I guarantee to you, we always can reach this high, then all the other competitors below 90%. The gap is huge. I guarantee to you, if you do this again, you will see on our Z390 uh, motherboard. Are these permutations tested manually by people, or is this done by... M so getting a job as an intern at Azus is terrible. Yes, that terrible. sounds like... But that is our job, to ensure yeah. the best motherboard in the market. Wow, wow. Well, thank, uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Leo Alder for Kit Guru. This is Azus in London. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.